Welcome back to All About Money on HKIBC. I'm Chloe Fung. In a fresh push to be techno technologically self-sufficient, China is challenging Boeing and Airbus with its first homegrown aircraft in the highly lucrative market for narrow-body jets. The twin NGC-919, built by state-owned Commercial Aircraft Corp of China, or COMEC, was certified at Beijing Capital Airport in late September. As it prepares to enter service, what are the opportunities and challenges ahead? Andrew Charton, the managing director of an aviation consultancy, joins us from Brussels. So it's great to have you today. Thank you for being on our show, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And first, I, I want to talk more about the certificate that the C919 acquired. So can you briefly run us through the certification? How important is it and how many more certificates, for example, does it need to acquire before ramping up the mass production of this, of this airplane? Uh, well, first of all, this certificate is fundamental. It's vital. The aircraft kind of would not have been allowed to be um, manufactured at all without this certification. This certification means that the aircraft can fly with passengers on board, with humans on board, commercial flights around China. And that's really important. Uh, in terms of producing, uh, producing or putting this aircraft into production now in China, that's all that's necessary. So it's, as I said, a fundamental step. However, the certification will need to be replicated if the aircraft is to be sold or to be operated in other countries. So, for example, with Europe, uh, with the United States, with Australia, places like that. Now, that's quite a large challenge, but it's not quite as large a challenge as it sounds because China and the European Aviation Safety Agency, for example, and China and the FAA have a very good working relationship. Uh, the CAAC of China, I should say, a very good working relationship. There's a, a huge commitment worldwide to aviation safety and you wouldn't want it any other way. So there's, in terms of getting this aircraft into the air, this is all that you need, but that air will be in China until such time as the aircraft uh, tries to operate in other countries. Hmm. And what do you think about is competitiveness in the future? I mean, is it competitive enough to really challenge, for example, Boeing or Air, um, Airbus as it wished? And uh, what do you think about this market outlook in the future as well? Uh, look, that's a really difficult question. It's a difficult answer. It's an easy question. It's a difficult answer. The C919 is a perfectly great aeroplane, I'm sure. It, I'm sure it's, it works really well. But for most of the world's aviation market, you need more than one aeroplane. As you say, this is in the narrow body uh, area. But most airlines want one aircraft that's got 120 seats, one aircraft that's got 160 seats, one aircraft that's got 200 seats, and they've all got to be common so that the crew and the cabin crew and what have you can work on any of them. Airlines need that so that they can match the equipment to the market. And at the moment, the, the 919 is the only aircraft in, in COMAX range. And of course, ultimately, airlines also like to have a wide body aeroplane so they can do long haul flights as well. So this is a great first step, but please don't be under any misapprehension. It, it's a first step. If you think about Airbus, there's the A320 series, which includes the 18, the 19, the 21. Um, there's also then the, the A350 and, and, of course, the A380. Not that I think the A380 is going to be built anymore. But what you're looking at is a really useful set of aircraft, all of which can be operated by the same pilots, all of which can be operated by the same crew. So your commonality is very high and your training costs, therefore, are lower and your maintenance costs are lower and so forth. And for COMAC to get into that space, it's going to need to be competitive in every part of the market, not just in the one narrow strip of the market, which the C919 is at the moment. Mm. And uh, also, but, you know, on the other hand, so far, neither the aviation regulation regulator or nor the manufacturer issued statements to confirm, you know, whether the jet had been formally approved to begin commercial services. So do you think there will be still some uncertainties at some level? Uh, well, I think there will. The first time an aeroplane is brought into the market, of course, there are uncertainties, and customers want to be absolutely reassured so that their customers, the passengers, are completely reassured. But 
I think that's just a matter of, of time and it's just a matter of the process working out and for COMAC to reassure the CAAC that this is a perfectly safe aircraft. And I have no doubt in my mind that it's a perfectly safe aeroplane. Um, the, the issue will be getting customers and getting customers outside of China. Um, already I know that the, the, um, the C919 has orders from Chinese airlines and very, very importantly, has orders from uh, Western aircraft leasing companies such as Aircap, uh, who are part of the mix of how airlines um, fund and operate their fleets. So everything is pointing in the right direction, but uh, it'll be some time before COMAC can produce uh, a fleet of aircraft that would be of interest to most airlines. Right. I mean, I'm just uh, wondering, do you have any forecast on how long could it take for, uh, for them to make a further step in, in terms of mass production? Do you have a timeline in your mind? Uh, well, I would imagine mass production, which is another fairly major effort. I mean, aircraft engineers don't grow on trees. Uh, you can't just take someone off the street and turn him into or she into someone who makes engines, who makes aeroplanes. It's a very skilled area. But uh, I could imagine that we're looking at two years till this aircraft is, is out there and flying around. Also, <clears throat> for, for Boeing and for Airbus, who have enormous experience at this, they build on average together combined about 2,000 aircraft a year. And on any one sort of aircraft, it's a very good year if they're building um, 100 aeroplanes Ah, that's unfair. Um, 500 aeroplanes um, of any one sort. So it's going to take a long time to get to the place where um, where this aircraft is is really common. Hmm. And as you just mentioned, the certification the plane gets so far is from the Chinese aviation authorities, right? So, which means that the plane will only be allowed to fly within China's territory until it is certified for by some foreign regulators. But I'm thinking now, as the tension between China and the U.S. Uh, is increasing and there are s still some like tensions ongoing. So how positive are you um, like to say that China could get or acquire other foreign certificates in the near future? Uh, I'm, I'm quite positive. Yes, there are political issues always. But I, let me tell you and let me assure your, your viewers, we take aviation safety really seriously. And there's already uh, correspondence. As I said, there is an agreement between EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency, and the CAAC on safety. It's, it's, a, it's a discussion about how we exchange, how we, how we work together to get safety going. Safety's never really been uh, an issue that gets held up by the politics, at least not to, a, not to a large extent. And the fact that there is tension, perhaps, as you say, and maybe that tension increases, but that's not for me to predict, um, between the United States and, and China, there's plenty of markets outside the United States. And let me just go back to the first point you made, which is that China, it's, it may only operate within China, but China is a an enormous market, and it's an, a market with enormous potential. And, and once the pandemic uh, clarifies and the situation opens up, if, if the Chinese market behaves in any way like every other market in the world, we are going to see an enormous surge in traffic, an enormous surge in traffic. I hope that the Chinese aviation industry, not just COMAC, um, has learned from what happened in Europe <clears throat> and in the United States, excuse me, um, and, and is ready because we saw a massive surge in traffic as people who have been denied travel for three years decided that they really wanted to take a trip. Right. Uh, I very much agree with you on the safety points because, you know, we, we've just seen some airline disasters or accidents earlier this year as well, and the investigation mm -hmm. is still ongoing. And now moving on to Hong Kong's aviation status, because now the city is where we are now, and it is trying to reopen with the world as well, although there are still some curbs uh, existing. And... Uh, you know, this week, Virgin Atlantic has even can has cancelled 
plans to resume flights between Hong Kong and London from early next year, attributing the decision to the operational complexity resulting from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I mean, this kind of surprised the market as well. And what do you think about the airline's decision? And do you think some other, for example, airlines could fill into the market gap uh, now so that we can have more competitors uh, and there will be not a monopoly at some level. For example, well, now it, the city's flagship Pacific is, you know, having more routes, uh, like controlling the Hong Kong and European routes. What do you think about this? Well, uh, again, a couple of things to say. Uh, the, the Virgin Atlantic decision is based entirely on the, on the operational fact that as a European airline, it's not allowed to fly over Russian airspace. Um, that's that's a decision both of the Europeans who have banned it, but of course, more importantly, the Russians who will not allow it. The Russian ban does not apply to Chinese airlines, funnily enough. So Chinese airlines can fly over Russian airspace. That puts about uh, an advantage of about three or four hours per flight onto the Chinese airlines. So they have a huge benefit from that at the moment. Now that. Having said every, we only care about safety, that, of course, is a purely political decision, uh, and that's a decision made by both Russia and, and, and in this case, Europe. But the... Uh, so, generally speaking, in a market which is as open and as competitive as aviation is, if there's a, if there's a, a, a pseudo-monopoly, which at the moment there is in Hong Kong for all those pandemic and historical reasons, which we understand, uh, the... The airlines are very quick to exploit that. And if, if they see that there's a market opportunity, I think you can bet that the uh, the market will will move in to take it. It may not be to Europe. It may be around Asia. Uh, it may be to the United States, which, of course, isn't affected by the uh, airspace closures. So I think it's a question as much of how quickly Hong Kong recovers and what Hong Kong does into the future. Hong Kong has had a very hard time during the, during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of business has transferred to Singapore, um, but I still think Hong Kong has a, a role to play in, in the global economy. Hmm. And one last question, Andrew. What do you think about the outlook for the airline business, especially on travel business, by the end of this, this year? Will, will you see, or do you think it will be a very strong recovery for 2022? Uh, yes and no, is the answer. Do I, I think, I think that airlines will get back to 2019 levels of, um, of flying by about 2024. So I think there's a little bit to go. The situation here in Europe, for example, is that we're looking at about 88% of the traffic that we had. Uh, a, a good percentage of, of the 12% that's missing is flights to Asia, I should add, flights to China, flights to Hong Kong and so forth. Japan has only just started to open up. There's, there's still um, hesitancy in, in the Asian market. And most people, IATA, for example, the Trade Association for Airlines is predicting 2024. Eurocontrol is predicting 2024. Uh, I think, though, that said, we've had a good year in terms of traffic. 88% is, is, I think, almost anybody in the aviation industry, if you'd said to them on the 1st of January, by the end of the year, you'll be at 88% of your flying. They'd have taken that with both hands, no questions asked. Thank you very much for your thoughts today, Andrew. That's Andrew Charlton, the Managing Director of Aviation Advocacy, which is an independent air transport-focused strategic consulting and government affairs consultancy based in Switzerland. Appreciate your time and thank you for watching All About Money. We'll be back on HKIBC next Sunday night. Until the next time, please take care.